from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good evening. My name is Roberta Schaefer, and I have the absolute pleasure of serving as the 24th Law Librarian of Congress. Tonight is a particularly exciting evening for me because it represents the, um, the really bringing to fruition a discussion and a dream that Rob Casper and I had about five years ago about somehow marrying law and poetry, law and literature, and um, my dream at the time, although I never shared this with Rob, or my cartoon balloon at the time, was to totally redefine the concept of poetic justice. <laughs> and so I hope that we will be able to do that tonight because there is something very, very important about the sibling relationship between law and poetry. And in fact, Attica Locke, the um, the 2016 recipient of the Harper Lee Prize for Fiction, has said that law and literature are really fraternal twins. And surely we can see that they share the womb of words in both an oral and a written tradition. But law and poetry and law and literature find common ground in their reliance upon storytelling, in their heavy use of analogy and metaphor, in their predilection for form and format, which they then love to take great liberties with, the reliance upon history and precedent, and let's not forget the heavy use of fiction in both disciplines. <laughs> the immortal Shelley provides some confirmation in what I call an early amicus brief to civilization. His 1821 defense of poetry, a legal term, calls poets the unacknowledged legislators of the world. And in a more contemporary setting, the poet and songwriter, Leonard Cohn, who is now ultimately legitimated by the Nobel Prize to Bob Dylan, calls poetry the evidence of life. So before I turn the podium over to the true stars of the evening, I just want to make some uh, acknowledgments. And the first is to my wonderful, extraordinary colleague, Rob Casper, the head of the Poetry and Literature Center. He wears, in my mind, the triple crown. He is a colleague, triple crown. He is a colleague extraordinaire. He is an incredibly cool guy. And he is so, so creative. Let me also do a call out to our new head of the uh, Center for the Book, Pam Jackson, who's sitting in the audience. The Center for the Book, the, the, uh, the Poetry and Literature Center is nested within the Center for the Book, a perfectly wonderful pairing again. But let me just conclude by saying that our goal for this evening is to provide clear and convincing evidence beyond a reasonable thought that law and poetry share so much in their DNA and together they enrich the world. Indeed, they are wonderful conspirators in helping us to better understand our current times and then help us to transfer the enormous knowledge assets that we will leave as a legacy to the future. So with that, I welcome Rob to the podium. Thank you so much for being here. Wow. Um, I have a more prosaic uh, introduction to make after that wonderfully lyrical um, uh, welcome by Roberta. I should say that um, five years ago, I remember going to the Law Librarian's office uh, and talking about a possibility of a program uh, with Roberta and Robert Newland, who's now our chief of staff at the library. And um, afterwards, calling my dad up, who is a small town lawyer in uh, Wisconsin, saying, I just met the law librarian of the Law Library of Congress, and we're going to do something. And 
I'm happy now I can tell him that we actually finally did. Uh, <laughs> with the proper pair, it really took the right, the right pair of people for us to uh, get this program off the ground. So uh, before we begin, uh, let me ask you to turn off your cell phones or any electronic devices that you have that might interfere with the event. Uh, uh, second, please note that this event is being recorded. Uh, and by participating in the Q&A session, you give us permission for future use of the rec this recording. Uh, this is the kind of event we're really excited about having uh, webcast uh, to let the whole world know about the ways in which we're thinking about law and literature. Uh, finally, let me tell you a little bit about the Poetry and Literature Center. We are home to the U.S. Poet Laureate, the Poet Laureate Consultant Poetry, established by a law, uh, an act of Congress in 1985. And we put on 30 to 40 programs like this throughout the year. Uh, to find out more about our literary programs, uh, you can sign on our sign-up sheet, which is out in the foyer, uh, and we'll send you emails about what's coming up. Uh, you can also visit our website, www.loc.gov uh, www slash poetry. There we go. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about how tonight's event's going to work. Uh, first, Monica Yoon will read from her uh, book and discuss her book, uh, Black Acre. It's her newest book of poetry. Uh, then, as you'll see, uh, Martha Dragic, uh, the Emeritus Professor of Law um, from the University of Missouri, will give a presentation about teaching law and literature in her many years as a professor. And then they will both come up on stage to participate in a moderated discussion, and we'll have time for your questions afterwards. Uh, we also have copies of Black Acre uh, for sale in the back. Uh, I hope you buy a copy and get Monica to sign it. Um, you can read more about both of our participants uh, in the print program that should be uh, on your chair uh, or next to you. Uh, but let me say how much I appreciate their willingness to bring this event to life. Uh, I've known Monica for a good long time. Uh, we're New York buddies. Uh, and I've talked to her often about her work as a poet and as an attorney. No one I know is more capable of connecting these two worlds with an understanding of what contemporary poetry is doing. And her new book exemplifies how poetry can employ concepts such as the legal fiction of Blackacre to powerfully personal ends. I look forward to hearing both of our featured speakers uh, begin this conversation about law and literature. So please join me in welcoming Monica Yoon and Martha Dragic. Thank you. Rob had asked me a couple of minutes ago whether uh, this was the first time I had read in a law library, and um, I had to tell him, um, uh, of course it is. I mean, the law, library, law libraries don't usually host poetry readings, and also it's, I think, maybe the time in which I felt my legal career and my poetic career come together most strongly because I'm staying at the same hotel that I would always stay in as a lawyer when I would come here to lobby on Capitol Hill or to attend oral argument at the Supreme Court. Um, and so it's uh, to be here as a poet rather than as a lawyer to be staying, you know, and eating at the corner bakery around, you know, is really very, uh, very interesting to me. Um, so I'm going to, you know, I'm really looking forward to kind of getting a conversation started uh, and some thinking started about the relationship between law and literature and, you know, and, you know, I guess my bailiwick would be the relationship between law and poetry. And so I was going to start off with a couple of uh, shorter poems that uh, employ some legal settings, legal concepts. Uh, this first one is called Sunrise Foley Square. Uh, Foley Square will be uh, familiar to anyone who's ever litigated in New York as, um, as the setting of the uh, state and federal courthouses uh, and will also be uh, familiar to fans of NYPD Blue. Uh, because uh, it's where the opening credits are shot. And this poem was set, uh, you know, it's an odd little poem, and I'm not quite sure whether it, su it succeeds. Um, it's a poem that's notable for absence because uh, it was written when, uh, uh, you know, when the Ferguson protests were taking place. And uh, my son had 
literally just been born. I mean, he was a couple of weeks old. I was in that, you know, new parent haze of nursing him around the clock. And we live only a couple of blocks from Foley Square, which is where a lot of these protests uh, were gathering. And so pretty much this sort of around the clock of, you know, of taking care of this newborn uh, coincided with round the clock helicopters, uh, sirens, um, and chants. Um, and, you know, and one morning, you know, before, right around sunrise, I noticed that all of the noise had stopped. Uh, and I was thinking about the absence of that noise and also how uh, kind of the expectation that there was always going to be another name to add to the list of, uh, of those, uh, those who had been uh, killed by police violence. And so this poem contains a, a blank, um, which I'll just kind of indicate by stopping. Um, Sunrise Foley Square. One siren stains the morning in concentric rings. Another starts up, stops, starts again, stops. Little chips of sound like a climber's hammer, testing for handholds on an upward sloping face. Daylight floods the soundscape with a clear liquid, thickening, flowing over and around. A lack that could be displaced but not entirely dispersed, an air bubble trapped in rubber tubing, something cone-shaped, nearly discernible, starting to resemble a cry. And this, this poem is also, uh, and we have a handout of this poem, which we'll discuss a bit later. This poem is also structured around uh, absence. It's called Landscape with Deodand. And I was, uh, you know, in law school, I was a huge, even before law school, actually, I was an enormous uh, legal history uh, geek. My favorite class in college was British constitutional history from 1060, 1066 to 1688. Uh, and, you know, and I took as much, like, very early English legal history as I could. And so a day and in Old English Law is kind of this fascinating thing. It is the instrumentality of a death. So if a tree branch falls off you, uh, falls off a tree and hits you, then the tree branch is the deodand. If a wagon kills you, then the wagon is the deodand. Um, you know, if a donkey kills you, then, you know, the donkey is the deodand. And under the law of deodands, there was a law for this, uh, all deodands were forfeit to the crown uh, and were usually destroyed um, in this odd sort of, uh, you know, and so this is a landscape with Deodand. A road in the trees from the sound of it, a milky shift in the water where the silt shelves down and the wet branch beating for its life against the pages of that book. So you can chew on that for a while and we'll discuss it later. <laughs> And then the, the title poem, um, the title sequence of the book, the title of the book is Blackacre. And those of you who, are, who attended law school in the Anglo-American tradition probably know that Blackacre, and those are, for those of you non-lawyers in the room, Blackacre is a legal placeholder term for a piece of property or an estate, the way John Doe is a legal placeholder term for a person. So oftentimes in your property law class and trusts and estates, you'll get, you know, John Doe uh, transfers his property Blackacre to Jane Roe in consideration for her property Whiteacre. Um, and there's a kind of sequence to the hypothetical, so it'll just spin out as Blackacre, Whiteacre, Greenacre, Blueacre, Brownacre. Uh, I added Redacre and Goldacre just because uh, I could. Um, poetic license, you know. Um, and so I thought, um, and I was thinking about, I used the thought of the acre to think about what is given and what is transformable. A piece of land is an interesting metaphor because you have a certain piece of land and there are things you can do with it. I mean, you could sell it to a shopping mall developer, you could build a house, you could plant a garden, you can uh, make a home, you can dig a grave, um, you could make it into your legacy. But there are certain things you can transform about it. There are certain things you cannot transform about it. At some point in dealing with a piece of land, a, you know, what we are allotted, uh, we come up against the concept of the given, you know, what cannot be transformed and what we pass on to those who uh, come after us. And so I was, you know, a lot of these acre poems ended up being works of art uh, or 
um, landscapes, what in poetry is called an ekphrastic poem. Um, you know, ways in which we can think of these mini landscapes as types of as pieces of land that can or cannot be transformed. So this first mini landscape will be familiar to you all. It is the back of the $1 bill, um, which has the Latin motto, annuit coeptus, which is a phrase from Virgil's George, uh, Georgics um, about, uh, you know, I think, I, I can't even remember, but like, uh, oh God, I'm gonna have to look up the translation. I'm sorry, I got very little. Um, yes, it's, uh, he favors our undertaking, so. Um, and it references the myth of Cadmus. Uh, Cadmus, for those of you who are mythology buffs, is the legendary founder of Thebes. So his sister Europa is, uh, is kidnapped by uh, Zeus, the white bull. And so he goes off looking for her and he completely, and he fails to find her, but um, instead he decides to found a city. He's told by an oracle to do this. And so he kills a dragon and he sows the dragon's teeth in the ground. This might be starting to sound a little familiar. And these armed men spring up, and the uh, and he doesn't. He's afraid of the armed men, so he throws a rock into their midst. And I'm kind of using this to think about the way in which, the unthinking way in which we want money to to be fruitful, to multiply. Um, the judge I clerked for was obsessed with the notion of usury, uh, and sort of so am I. Um, Greenacre. But what if a given surface is coaxed into fruitfulness? wrongfully. For instance, this lushly verdant plain. Imagine it dialed back to featurelessness, each spiraling stalk retracted, each filigree rosette slow blinking shut, dialed back to bare promise, to smooth napped expanse. The forehead of an alien princess might convey such tranquility. She surveys her ranks of suitors, shakes her exquisite green head in scarcely feigned regret. So thinks Cadmus, hand still outstretched in a nation-building gesture, as if to freeze in time this instant, scatter of seeds still aloft, arrayed like little dive bombers in formation, not yet puncturing the land, not yet rooting, not yet sending up terribly thin, ambitious tendrils toward the light, not yet trained onto wireframe espaliers, not yet combed into bombastic pompadours, not yet extruding seed pods resembling pale grapes, resembling pearls. The root of remorse isn't tooth, he recalls abruptly, but to bite, and then stoops, groping for the biggest rock he can find. I mean, here, uh, Brownacre is just a landscape. Brown Acre. After the clear plastic sheeting has been pulled back, folded away, after each woody rhizome has been pried loose from the soil, each snarl of roots traced to its capillary ends, twigs and pebbles tossed aside, worms reburied elsewhere, after the soil has been rubbed through a sieve, after the ground has been leveled with rakes and stakes and string, no need for further labor, further motion. Nothing has been sown. Nothing is germinating in the raw dirt. The light strikes each granule the same as any other. A windlessness rises, becomes a precondition. Why is it hard to admit you couldn't live here? No one could live here. This is not the texture of the real, lacking attachment, lacking event. This is neither landscape nor memory. This is parable, a caricature of restraint. But why does this shame you? Even now you're trying to hide that your gaze is drifting upward. This plainness cannot hold your attention. You're searching the sky for some marker of time, of change. In a cloudless sky, the sun beats down. But if you observe that the sun warms the soil, you must also concede that the soil will grow colder. The sun stains only the body, and the body is what is simply not at issue here. And then this is another poem called Brown Acre, uh, um, which is, I think, pretty straightforward. Brown Acre. We were sitting, leaning back against the house on the stone patio or terrace, 
Looking out over a steep drop at the mountains arrayed in a semicircle around us, all expectant angles like the music stands of an absent orchestra. Summer, col summer colors, orangey golds and dim blues, and there must have been greens as well. I wasn't paying attention. I was watching the thing you had just said to me still hanging in the air between us, its surfaces beating up with a shiny liquid like contempt that might have been seeping from the words themselves or else condensing from the air, its inscrutable humidity, the droplets rounding themselves as they fall, etching a darker patch on the patio tiles, a deepening concavity, and above it, a roughness in the air, the molecules of concrete coalescing grain by grain into a corrugated pillar topped by a cloud, a tree form, not a sapling or a mountain tree, but a tree that would look at home in a farmyard or meadow, sheltered from winds, branches stretching out with all confidence toward the horizon, a shape that should have been an emblem of sufficiency, of calm, but whose surfaces were teeming with a turbulent rush of particles like the inner workings of a throat exposed, and whose dimensions were expanding with shocking speed, accumulating mass, accumulating coherence and righteousness, pulling more and more of the disintegrating terrace into its form, taller than us, then shadowing us, and doubtlessly underground a root system of corresponding complexity and spread was funneling down displaced nothingness from a hole in the upper air. And then then it was time, and I should, stood up and went inside and shut the door, unsure what still anchored us to the mountainside. Um, and I'll end with this. Um, this is a, a strange poem. It's, um, it's based, I think, like a lot of poems, like a lot of legal opinions, it brought, brings a lot of contradictory things together. So. Uh, uh, partially a memory from uh, junior high school where um, a Twinkie um, we had come to understand or we were told was not a baked good. It was actually, you know, what we were told was it was like this kind of tube of paste that was extruded and then exposed to some sort of catalyzing chemical so it f grew this kind of golden foamy outer layer, right? Um, you know, uh, and then they sort of tinted the bottom of it brown with some tint of some kind to make it appear baked. And this is what I believed for um, for decades, up until a couple of years ago, um, actually, you know, I just thought, oh, okay, it's not a baked good. That's why shelf life is so long. Um, and unfortunately, this turned out not to be true. Uh, but um, you know, Gold Acre is also, uh, you know, Acre. When you're thinking of Acre uh, legacy, you're also, you know, obviously thinking about identity. You're thinking specifically about race. And as I, um, as I have a son and I'm thinking of raising him, you know, as a Korean American and I think, well, you know, as an immigrant who was born here, my own relationship to being Korean American is not exactly authentic. I don't speak the language. I'm not the person who can tell you what the best thing to order on the menu is at every Korean restaurant. Um, you know, and what does it mean to be, uh, you know, so that made me think of the other junior high school sense of Twinkie, which is someone yellow on the outside and white on the inside. Um, I think, you know, lawyers might enjoy, lawyers are always grammar nerds, so um, the other thing to notice about this poem is it's all cast in the subjunctive, you know, the as if it were. The, uh, the subjunctive is uh, the mode in which we express fantasy or the improbable. And one interesting thing about the English language in particular is our fantasy mode is often indistinguishable from the past tense. So it's uh, you know you so you know sometimes we often tend to think of the past as if it were our you know uh, the past becomes a kind of fantasy and often a racial fantasy. Um, Goldacre, as if you were ever wide-eyed enough to believe in urban legends, as if these plot elements weren't the stalest of cliches: the secret lab, the anaerobic chamber, the gloved hand ex machina the chemical-infused fog. As if every origin story didn't center on the same sweet myth of a lost wholeness. As if such longing would seem more palatable if packaged as nostalgia. As if inner and outer were merely phases of the same substance. As if this whiteness had been your original condition. 
as if it hadn't been what was piped into you, what seeped into each vacant cell, each air hole, each pore, as if you had started out skinless, shameless, blameless, creamy as if whipped, passive as if extruded, quivering with volatility in a metal mold, as if a catalyzing vapor triggered a latent reaction, as if your flesh foamed up, a hydrogenated emulsion consisting mostly of trapped air, as if, though sponge-like, you could remain shelf-stable for decades, part embalming fluid, part rocket fuel, part glue, as if you had been named twin, a word for likeness, or wink, a word for joke, or ink, a word for stain, or key, a word for answer, as if your skin oxidized to its present burnished hue, golden, as if homemade. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My immediate task is to talk just a little bit about law and literature, uh, responding to the question that may be latent in many of your minds, what do the two have to do with each other? Now, Roberta talked about that some. Um, and, and I have to say, I will talk about literature, generally speaking, rather than about poetry specifically, because I am not qualified to talk about poetry uh, specifically. Um, so about 20 or 30 years ago, law schools started offering courses in law and literature. Um, there are an amazing variety of, uh, uh, an amazing variety of such courses. There is a, a literature of law and literature that has uh, developed. And it's hard to generalize um, much about these courses and this field of study uh, because they're characterized most by variety. Um, but I'll try to give you, just uh, in, in very brief form, a few of the objectives, why people offer such courses, why people uh, write about law and literature. What, what do we think uh, we, that either, either field can learn from the other one? How do they uh, correspond with each other? Uh, and just by coincidence, uh, I read something the other day. I was reading a, a very new book of essays by a poet, Mary Oliver. Uh, the collection of essays is called Upstream, uh, and I read this sentence, um, which uh, seemed to me quite pertinent. She says, the best use of literature bends not toward the narrow and the absolute, but to the extravagant and the possible. Well, narrow and absolute sound to me something like law, and extravagant and possible uh, perhaps something like literature. So, and she goes on to say that rather than providing answers, I'm paraphrasing now, rather than providing answers, uh, Mary Oliver suggests, uh, literature opens doors and tells us to look at things and think about things for ourselves. So um, that, I think, encapsulates uh, perhaps the uh, few uh, strands that I'll talk about uh, in the study and teaching of law and literature. So uh, these are some of the most prominent uh, objectives. One is to contextualize law and events triggering the application of law. Appellate opinion, the, the way we teach in law schools is to use appellate opinions. So the end of the line, um, the, the end of the story, after everything has happened, uh, much being, uh, having been stripped out along the way, condensed down to a, a narrow set of relevant facts uh, and so forth. Um, so law as um, delivered to law students and to lawyers um, is uh, narrow in that sense. Uh, focus, it has a very narrow focus. Uh, literature, on the other hand, paints a much richer picture. It's full of uh, the details uh, of events and lives and personalities, um, circumstances, motivations, and so forth. So finding a way to bring some of this context back in and to understand that regardless of what the appellate opinion says in the end, that may be the condensed version that's relevant to the rule of law that's established, but earlier on there was a lot more to the story. And it's important for 
law students in particular to develop an understanding because they're going to be dealing with real people who are coming in at the beginning of the story um, with a whole set of life circumstances and hopes and dreams and problems and whatnot. So building that context back in uh, is one objective. Another objective uh, of the law and literature movement, if you could call it that, that's too strong a word. Um, but law and literature does have some uh, early um, connection with um, law, uh, with critical legal studies, law and feminism, things of that uh, nature. So the objective is to recognize differences in law's meaning and its impact on uh, individual people and, and different groups of people. So law often speaks universally, abstractly, using words like, as Monica pointed out, Blackacre, John Doe, and so forth, um, that are um, abstract or that are perhaps fictions. Um, and it relies on concepts like, for example, self-defense. That's a concept that might be understood and felt and experienced and appreciated very differently by people of different ages, genders, races, and so forth. Um, so just to, um, again, sort of reintroduce uh, that notion into legal study. And literature helps that because literature helps us see into the lives of people who are not like us, helps us develop um, an understanding of what their lives might be like. Another is to humanize law. So this universal tone that law has, uh, the matter of fact nature of an appellate opinion, can deaden law students' ability to relate to parties' uh, situations and to respond in a caring way. Um, literature, on the other hand, arouses our emotions and invites us to uh, assess, to judge the um, actions of characters. And finally, law and literature study uh, sometimes uh, hopes to open a conversation uh, about the relationship between justice and mercy, the, the dimensions of fairness, uh, and so on. Um, so, law, so studying literature and discussing literature can help us perhaps reconcile uh, the demands of justice and the desire uh, for mercy. And uh, there's a strong argument to be made that one important ingredient in reconciling justice and mercy is the development of empathy, which is what literature, uh, one, at least one of the things that literature can help us do. So despite all of these various approaches to law and literature, the different aims and objectives and so forth, I haven't seen any work really uh, significantly exploring law and poetry. So we have a perfect opportunity tonight uh, in our conversation with Monica Yoon uh, to open that window a little bit, uh, perhaps, through her reading, which we've just heard from her collection, uh, Blackacre. So uh, at this point, I think I'll invite Monica to join me up here, and we will uh, have a conversation. an embarrassment of water up here. <laughs> <laughs> we certainly do. <laughs> so as you may have uh, gathered, how could you not, from the poems that Monica read for us earlier, her collection Blackacre includes an astonishing variety uh, of poems, both as to subject matter uh, and form. Uh, those of us not well trained in poetry, and I include myself in that uh, group, certainly, um, may still think of poems in sort of a grade school kind of a way with tidy verses, uh, strict meters, uh, incessant rhyming. Um, these poems don't look that way, uh, I'm happy to say. Uh, and so uh, perhaps they begin to challenge at least uh, unsophisticated, rudimentary uh, notions of what poetry is. So let me begin our conversation, Monica, by asking how you see, or whether you see, uh, your work in Blackacre, um, where it fits in, how it relates, whether it exemplifies things going on in contemporary American poetry. Um, I think that, you know, it does, 
you know, it is reasonably representative, and you know, Rob can speak to this as well, of what is going on in contemporary American poetry in that I think uh, traditional form, what uh, is often referred to as received form, is one option among many. And you know, this, you know, I always feel like this seems more odd to people than it perhaps should. I mean, you can think of representational or figurative painting as being one option among many options of painting. You can think of painters as moving back and forth across various modes of representation, and you don't find that strange, but you know, if a poet is to to write in a way that doesn't resemble a traditional form. You know, it's like, oh my God, call the police. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that, uh, you know, so I think poets these days are taking advantage of the widest possible palette, the widest possible toolbox uh, for, you know, for enacting um, or rendering uh, various states of mind, states of consciousness, uh, states of language. Mm -hmm. um, and so, though your poems don't necessarily follow those received uh, mm -hmm. forms, um, I noticed uh, in my reading of them, they do seem to invoke legal conventions in a, in a certain sense. Uh, for example, and you use this one, in the first Greenacre poem you have the, the motto, he favors our understandings. Uh, very often you invoke at the beginning of the poem or, uh, or elsewhere in the poem. Um, uh, you, you mentioned Cadmus. Uh, Blackacre, the longer uh, Blackacre uh, poem at the end of the collection, responds to Milton's Sonnet 19 on blindness. So I wonder if you could talk with us about why it's important to you to tie your work to those thoughts, those uh, artworks, even paintings you mentioned in several poems from the past? Um, I think that writing in what's called an ekphrastic mode is interesting to me because it um, both uh, allows and takes away a certain freedom um, in that if you're writing about an existing story, you don't have to tell the story. You can just talk about the story. If you're writing about an existing work of art, uh, you don't have to describe the work of art. The work of art exists. Someone can go look at it if they want to. Uh, you know, that, you know, explicatory burden is off of you. I mean, you know how annoying it is, uh, you know, in the first couple of scenes of a movie where some character for no reason at all will just launch into this sort of paragraphs long explanation of like the settings and the context and who's who and who's related to who. And you know that's just being done to like relieve themselves of this epic, of this burden of explanation. And you know, the great, one great thing about writing ekphrastically is you don't have to do that. You don't have to explain yourself as much. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, you do have a certain fidelity to uh, what came before. Um, you know, you have, your parameters are set and you're sort of, you know, tethered in a way, mm -hmm. uh, in a way that, and so I find that interplay between being free and being constrained to be very interesting. And so, do you, um, do you connect that, uh, with, in your thinking, with traditions of citation and precedent? Absolutely. I think that, you know, when you were talking uh, uh, about the connection between law and literature, uh, you know, a lot of what tends to be focused in the law and literature curriculum are the narrative uh, connections, and I think what tends to get left behind is, are the, the language connections, the way legal language and poetic language function similarly. Um, and the way I like to explain this, uh, you know, is, you know, in ordinary language, uh, words are pretty much straightforward. They're what my friend James Longenbach calls like a disposable container for meaning. Like, you know, I am going to pick up this bottle. There's nothing unclear about that. Um, and lawyers, I think, you know, poets know better and lawyers in a weird way know better. I mean, if you're looking over contractual language on behalf of a client, and you're trying to figure out whether this is good contractual language, one of the things you have to do is imagine every possible scenario 
that could be applied to a particular clause? Like, what is the most far out possible interpretation uh, that someone could make of that clause, and how do we come to terms with that? How do we cabin? You know, you have to recognize the uncertainty of language before you can deal with the uncertainty of language. Uh, you know, similarly, I think in the common law tradition, which I, you know, uh, I was a litigator, so I'm obsessed with common law. Um, you know, you have phrases like, you know, cruel and unusual punishment or due process of law mm -hmm. or person that are by no means straightforward. I mean, no one is just saying, oh, okay, those are, you know, those are readily understandable terms just to be taken at face value. You know, as a lawyer, that your job is to go through every instance uh, in which those uh, phrases have been used. And so these things just can move through history. They're accumulating layers of meaning as they go through. Mm -hmm. And I tell my students, you know, it's kind of the same thing with poetic language. Like if you say apple in a poem, you're dealing with Snow White, you're dealing with Adam and Eve, you're dealing with the computer company, you're dealing with, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow's daughter, you're dealing, you know, you, you have all of those resonances <laughs> that you need to take account of. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think both, you know, but both poets and lawyers feel that there's a lot of, at stake in recognizing, but also working with the uncertainty of language. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so maybe this would be a good point at which to return to the poem that you read earlier, Landscape, mm -hmm. Landscape with Theodon. Yeah. Um, you uh, explained that legal concept uh, in your reading of the poem, uh, but I thought perhaps you could sort of lead us through a reading of the poem, and the audience has a copy yeah. uh, of the poem. Um, yeah, and I'll just, I mean, I don't think that there's anything particularly uncertain about this language. What I was playing with really here is the relationship between the title and the poem. The poem itself consists of a road in the trees from the sound of it, a milky shift in the water where the silk shelves down at the wet branch beating for its life against the pages of that book. So if I were to ask one of my students in intro poetry, you know, what is going on in this poem? And, you know, the, po the student would say something like, okay, well, there are these kind of observed details of landscape. There's a bit of uncertainty. You're not quite sure what's happening, what's being looked at. But at the same time, you're reasonably clear that you're in a landscape. There's, you know, there's a road, there are trees, there are water. We don't doubt any of that. Um, and then there's this oddly personified wet branch beating for its life, so there's an urgency suggested there against the pages of that book. And that that book is specific in a way that calls attention to itself, and you don't know why that book is important. Uh, and then you have the title, Landscape with Deodand, mm -hmm. which causes you to, you know, it's as if you were to, you know, say someone in this audience has committed a crime, you know? <laughs> to say landscape with Deodand is to make you look at every noun in the poem and say, wait a second, is that the murder instrument? Mm -hmm. Is that the murder mm -hmm. instrument? Is that the murder mm -hmm. instrument? Uh, and, you know, what are the various murders that could have taken place with a, you know, a wet branch or, a, you know, a road <laughs> in the trees? Um, and so, you know, I was kind of, think, you know, so really this poem is about kind of playing with this idea of expectation and mm -hmm. suspicion um, in, a same, in the same way that the Foley, I, I, I read this with the Foley mm -hmm. Square poem with that mm -hmm. blank in it to think of, okay, well, what does it mean to have a blank in the poem to set up the reader's expectation that that blank will be filled and that, that blank will be filled mm -hmm. with a name? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the poem, you know, I think when I tell my students, you know, what is the medium of poetry? The medium of painting is paint. The meaning of medium of music may, maybe notes, maybe time, you know, a relationship between sound and time. Uh, what is the medium of poetry? Um, and, you know, words, certainly, uh, white space, maybe, but also the expectations that are created in the reader's mind by things like titles, uh, by things like blanks. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> Thank you. So I wonder then if you might uh, talk with us a bit um, about your uh, longtime dual life as a <laughs> lawyer and poet, and specifically about how your experiences of each profession inform the other. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, let me stop there for the moment. Yeah, I mean, I was always very enamored of both. And in fact, when I was an undergraduate, I had uh, 
done a political science major with a focus on legal theory. And then, uh, and I combined that with a creative writing minor. And for my creative writing minor, I wrote this long, terrible, terrible, terrible um, poetry sequence that my students still will like dig up out of the stacks and like taunt me with. Um, but that was based on Paul's Graf versus Long Island Railroad Company, uh, 1928, which, um, which you know, those uh, many of you know is one of uh, Benjamin Nathan Cardozo's most, absolutely most famous opinions. And this ties directly into what Martha was talking about earlier about how this, um, how what seems, even in Cardozo's like, you know, beautiful language, uh, seems like a factual scenario is itself, uh, you know, is itself shaped by all of these different points of view. What actually happened in this very strange? Uh, I should probably explain what happened. So, <laughs> Paul's Graph versus Long Island Railroad Company is a classic tort case that is used in I think every first year tort <laughs> textbook to explain the principle of proximate cause and negligence, which is how far fetched does a chain of causation have to be? Uh, in order for you still to be liable for it. And so what happened to Mrs. Paulsgraf, Mrs. Paulsgraf is a, a cleaning woman, and she's standing on the platform of the Long Island Railroad Company a train uh, trying to go to Rockaway Beach. Um, it is August, it is very hot, it is very crowded. Uh, this man drops a package on the tracks. Uh, the train runs over the package. The package, as it turns out, contains fireworks. Um, the fireworks explode, uh, causing a crowd to stampede. The crowd on the platform knocks over a pair of scales that fall on Mrs. Paul's graph that um, this isn't actually in Cardozo's opinion, but you know the facts of the case are actually that the damage was that it triggered a latent psychiatric disorder causing her to become mute. And so you're like, okay, so <laughs> um, is the l railroad company liable to Mrs. Paul's graph um, under, the, uh, under a negligence, under the tort of negligence? And, um, and my, the judge, I actually ended up clerking for, uh, you know, years, uh, five years later, um, through some weird coincidence, uh, Judge John Noonan on the Ninth Circuit uh, had written a book called Persons and Masks of the Law, yes. which is one of the early classics yes. of law and literature, uh, which um, talks about the Mrs. Paul's graph decision and talks about the way in which Cardozo very carefully shapes the narrative that makes it into the finished appellate uh, mm -hmm. You know, to make it seem, to make his uh, his account of things seem more uh, more inevitable, mm -hmm. more certain. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and um, and so and then I was also studying. I took a class with the great legal historian Morton Horowitz, mm -hmm. um, and uh, he had also kind of framed the Mrs. Call, Paul's graph decision and said that you know, well, this decision is being written at the same time that modernist artists are thinking about what does it mean to frame a work of art? How do we, you know, consider these shifts in perspective, these changes in, you know, in the technologies of representation? Um, and so, you know, I wish more of this had made it into the terrible, terrible poems that I wrote, um, you know, inspired by that. But, you know, so I've always kind of been thinking about the ways in which uh, the two go together. And, you know, in my last job as a lawyer, I was a constitutional uh, lawyer working with a lot of this language, and you know I was working both with appellate attorneys who, as crafters of language, uh, you know are really hard to match, um, and also with my boss, who was President Clinton's chief speechwriter for five years, and who I worked with very closely, and we would talk about the ways in which legal language and poetic language uh, were related. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a perfect segue into um, asking you how you use the tools of poetry in your law practice? Uh, well, I did once get to you uh, to point out that a uh, in a trademark case that something was a trochee. I think that that was my like, my favorite um, my favorite moment. But no, I think that the tools of poetry, uh, compression, uh, repetition, um, you know, those sort of cadences uh, are oftentimes the tools of um, of what makes you a good advocate or not, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you're, you know, delivering oral argument or uh, when you're trying to write a brief in which you're trying to, you know, compress, 
you know, 100,000 pages of trial record into a, you know, a 54 or 28 page brief with all of the, you know, rule, what is it, 35, like, you know, font and margin restrictions. <laughs> and, you know, and trying to do that and trying to boil it down to its core and to come up with a way in which the court hasn't thought about it was absolutely about the crafting of language. I mean, I think no one ever devotes as much thought to semicolons as lawyers and poets do. You know? um, like, no one else cares that much about, like, you know, or, you know, advertising. You know, I mean, there are a lot of, um, a lot of professions that focus very, very intensively on the written word, but certainly those are two of them. Yes. Um, and I have to say, in this collection, that's one of the things I most love is the uh, grammatical nerdiness, or whatever it was you <laughs> called it earlier. Mm -hmm. The um, very careful word choices, the punctuation, the white space, all of it, it's just yeah. very, very uh, compelling. Well, yeah, because I remember one of my, uh, one of my law professors uh, had a challenge to the class, which was there was a particular restatement of some you know, sub-principle of negligence. I can't remember what it was. And it was 28 words long, that I do remember. And um, he said, if anyone can make this 27 words without, you know, you know, without losing either accuracy or grammar, then you will automatically get an A in this course, and no one could do it. I mean, that was the most compressed possible form in which you mm -hmm. could say that. And you know, that sort of training um, mm -hmm. is something that's, you know, that hopefully remains a part of the legal profession mm -hmm. for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, people make fun of legal language yes. all the time, but you know, but it's it's functional language often when it's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you used the word advocate a few minutes ago, which of course describes the role of an attorney. Uh, how do you see your role as a poet? And I suppose I would append to that question uh, whether you could give us an example from your current collection, Black Acre, that particularly uh, exemplifies that role. I don't know that I can think, I don't know that I have a role as a poet. I mean, I am a poet. Like, I, uh, you know, I feel like I have a role as a teacher of poetry. Mm -hmm. I feel like I have a role, um, you know, but as a poet, it's interesting, you know, uh, part of the reason I ended up shifting over to poetry is because I wanted the ability to define my own forms, to say that this is going, I'm going to set my, um, you know, uh, you know, my, uh, one of my poetic mentors, Paul Muldoon, is, uh, I can't remember, you know, he says that a, every poem has rules, but every poem sets its own rules, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm a rule-bound person, I realize that, but I don't necessarily want someone else setting the rules for me, mm -hmm. and, you know, I feel like the rules by which I write are necessary to the poem to succeed. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to have the freedom to find those rules myself, to discover the rules that will make this particular poem be an expression of this uh, particular thought process. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Perhaps with that, I will um, invite questions from any members of the audience for Monica. Not a scholar of the law. Um, could you tell us uh, what the outcome was? Uh, <laughs> Mrs. Paul's graph. Oh, the railroad was not liable. <laughs> um, this, this was too far fetched. Yes, this was too far fetched. So, uh, and the way in which uh, Paul's, and the way in which Cardozo, uh, you know, describes the story is to maximize the outlandishness of what happened, to kind of make the narrative point. No one could possibly have foreseen this, you know, this train of events, whereas had he phrased it simply as something like, on a crowded platform, could someone get hurt? You know, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, hmm? He almost made it satirical. Yeah, he almost made fun, you know, and he that's one of the points. Yeah. That is one of the things that I think people took exception to, it being in Facebook and being yeah, it was, it was almost half a parody. Because you get these cases, you know. I was, uh, I recently, uh, 
I read at Columbia a couple weeks ago, and a student there is a poetry student who's taking tort law for the first time. And you know, he was talking about all these classic canard cases, like the lighted squib, or the the eggshell leg, and you know, like all of these, you know, cases that you know, you're just like, you know, they're funny, but at some point they were real people. You know, I mean, this but they're they're cast in the framework of the reasonable man, as we yeah. always said, not even a reasonable person. And yeah. So could a reasonable person have foreseen, foreseen all of this? this? Mm -hmm. So the writing in the the writing that um, uh, ups the outlandishness yeah. for against the result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you kind of learned as a you know as a litigator like you can win or you win or lose the case in the statement of facts. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. other questions? So someone will come with a microphone. Mm -hmm. useful for disciplines to have someone come in from the uh, mm -hmm. from the <clears throat> outside and kind of reality check them and I like the idea of poets as the unacknowledged <laughs> auditors yes. of the world in that <laughs> <just sense. laughs> But I do have, you know, like my, uh, my uh, dear friend and mentor, the poet Ray Armentrout, uh, spends a lot of time thinking about uh, astrophysics, uh, working um, as a poet in residence at various scientific laboratories. Um, I mean, this is happening, and, uh, you know, it is interesting to kind of bring a completely new way of thinking about, uh, especially determinacy and indeterminacy uh, to those fields. Uh, Well, thank you for your opening. Um, I just finished reading Ben Lerner's mm -hmm. new book, A Different Poetry, and I admire his novels a lot, but I must say I found the book very dispirited. Mm -hmm. And everything I've heard from you that makes me think you want to hear familiar with it. I've actually. read it, actually. So I'm curious what you maybe you could tell the audience what it says and what you think of that. Very well, I think for Ben to call the book The Hatred of Poetry was more of a sales tactic than anything else. It's not really what the book's about. Uh, I mean, the book starts off with a discussion of Marianne Moore's famous, uh, you know, first phrase to the poem called Poetry, I too dislike it. But, um, but what he goes on to really talk about is the difference uh, between the ideal poem um, as, you know, as rendered in various poems and the poet's inability to match up to that ideal, which you know doesn't end up for me having that much to do with the hatred of poetry period. Um, I do find uh, you know the notion that you know no one should be interested not just in poetry but any of the uh, but in art in general, in difficulty in general, a little bit dispiriting, I, I'm sure for the same reasons you're thinking about and uh, you know, and I think a lot of, you know, but I do enjoy, you know, my, our, we have a wide enough poetry program where I teach where uh, almost none of the students I have are English majors and most of my students mm -hmm. cannot name a single poet uh, on their first day of class mm -hmm. and I don't really pull my punches with them and, you know, and for these students who are very smart and very hardworking and very risk averse, mm -hmm. uh, to engage poetry is really interesting for them. What I tell them is that you are very used to learning how to succeed. You do not know how to fail. And there's something about art which has a humility be built in. It teaches failure. Um, it teaches uncertainty when people are used to success and certainty. And I think that, that you know, if that gets lost, then we're all in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Thank you 
so much. Um, I'm Emily Ray with the Friends of the Law Library of Congress, and it's so refreshing to have a poetry lecture in the of our legal uh, work that we do. Um, I work in the federal government, and some of our um, direction is under the Plain Language Act, but this is a <laughs> policy in plain language so that people can understand it. And um, I wondered about your perspective from, from as a poet and as a lawyer, um, and also how that might be affecting those fields if you continue down the path of plain language. Yeah, I love the idea of the Plain Language Act. I mean, if you've read any, you know, if you're used to legislation, uh, the problem is not that any of the words are incomprehensible in and of themselves, is that you have this, like, you know, this, you know, massive document that have, you know, phrases that are internally contradictory, that just cannot work together. I mean, the problem isn't of the language, the problem is, you know, the bill itself often. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, but I, yeah, and I feel like the, you know, it's all the fault of people trying to be too smart, uh, you know, to be kind of a troubling thing, you know, oh, the reason, uh, you know, it, it's because people are being overly fancy. No, it's because, you know, no one in Congress bothered to work out the details of this thing before they enacted it. Um, and because they're hiding compromises. And because they don't they're hiding own compromises. Up to. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why it's obscure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly, mm -hmm. uh, because they don't want people to understand it too well. Because if people understand it too well, they'll understand where the bodies are buried. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, moving from the language of statutes to the language of judicial opinions, mm -hmm. um, uh, first of all, do you have a, a favorite Supreme Court justice in terms of the peers? writing ability. Um, and then second, what role do you see uh, for poetry or for poetic thinking in the crafting of judicial opinions? And um, are there any pitfalls to thinking poetically uh, as a judge? Yeah. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, the answer to the both of those questions ends up kind of coming down to the same thing. I both love the writing of Benjamin Nathan Cardozo, as many people do, and I also deeply distrust the writing of Benjamin Nathan Cardozo. Uh, there's something about simplicity and analogy, which, uh, uh, which are the stock and trade of both poetry and law that are, um, that are so, uh, you know, that are so deeply powerful that when wrongly deployed, uh, they can wreak havoc because they, simply because they are so simple and so convincing. Like my previous job immediately before teaching poetry full time was I was a campaign finance uh, lawyer and advocate. And you know the, uh, the campaign finance law has been uh, shaped really, the constitutional law of campaign finance has been shaped by uh, three metaphors that money is speech, that corporations are people, and that elections are a marketplace. And those sound very simple and very appealing, but if you start to say, hey, wait a second, those analogies don't actually hold up all that well, then you know, it's, you, know, you start to see the, the troubling nature of, of you know, the pitfalls of poetic language uh, used in uh, you, you know, poetic language that has the power of law behind it. Um, mm -hmm. On that somewhat troubling note. <laughs> <laughs> we'll uh, uh, end this evening. Thanks to, so much to both Martha and Monica for an amazing conversation. A great, great, great start to our law and literature series. Hopefully to come again to the library. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming out. Uh, again, we hope you go buy Black Acre. Obviously, there are a lot more exciting poems in there for you to check out. Um, you can buy them in the back. Monica will sign the book. Uh, we also have surveys either on your seat or next to you. We hope you fill them out. It helps us in determining what we're going to do with our future programming. We hope you enjoy tonight. Uh, please write, write down what you think. Uh, you can give it to me. You can put it on the table or put it up here. Uh, and we hope to see you soon again. If you want to come to uh, more of our events, there's a sign-up sheet outside. And we hope to see you very, very soon. Thanks so much. Oh. Sure, we have a very exciting gavel pencil for each of our panelists. <laughs>